being here today. My name is Lina and I'm the co-chair of the Palestine Solidarity Committee. Um, I would just like to introduce our moderator for today, Dr. Alice Rothschild. Um, Dr. Alice is an obstetrician and a gynecologist. Um, she worked on healthcare reform and women's movements. Um, she developed an interest in the Palestinian-Israeli cause in 1997. Um, and in 2003, um, she started, she co-organized um, the annual health, um, the annual health forum, uh, th sorry, the annual health delegation in the West Bank and Gaza. Um, she's the author of Broken Promises, uh, Broken Promises and Broken Dreams. Um, she chairs the American um, Jews for Just Peace, and she graduated from Brunmar College with a BA degree in uh, psychology, and went to BU for medical school. Um, Dr. Rothschild will be introducing our speaker for today, um, Omar Ruthi. She also worked on. Uh, she's a part of the Boston Palestine uh, BDS movement. So without further ado, we'll leave you with Dr. Rothschild. Uh, just to let you know, we'll be selling books after the event. Um, it will be happening on the podium over here, and we have more books outside. Um, if you'd like your book signed, I'm will be available afterwards. Thank you. So thank you very much. I'm honored to be the moderator and also a discussant for tonight's event. Um, I've heard Omar Baghouti speak twice in Ramallah, both uh, in January of this year and then last year. So we're in for a real treat. Um, Omar is a well-known political analyst and human rights activist, a cultural critic, he is the founding member of the Palestinian Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel, called PACB, and the Palestinian Civil Society Boycott, Divestment, and Sanction, BDS, Campaign Against Israel. He holds a bachelor's and master's degrees in electrical engineering from Columbia University in New York, and a master's degree in philosophy with a focus on ethics in, from Tel Aviv University. As was mentioned, he's just released a book, Boycott, Divestment, Sanctions, the Global Struggle for Palestinian Rights, which is published by Haymarket Books uh, this April. So as a Jewish American activist, I want to reflect historically for a moment on the more general issue of boycott, divestment, and sanctions, BDS. I think it's important to remember that this tactic has a long tradition in our own country. BDS is part of an activist conversation. In the United States, it dates back to the Quakers who refused to do business with slave owners, and then the churches moved on to fighting alcohol and tobacco. We had the 1970s grape and lettuce boycotts, the boycott against Nestle's, Rosa Parks bus boycotts. In the 1980s, there was the um, fight against apartheid South Africa, and here at Harvard University, there was a tent in Harvard Yard with students urging the administration to divest from companies associated with South Africa. So you folks were fighting that struggle as well. And you know, much, much of this was inspired by Gandhi fighting the British uh, decades earlier. In the 1920s, uh, Jews in the Yeshuv, the Jewish community in historic Palestine, boycotted Jews who hired Arab workers. And Jews boycotted goods from Nazi Germany. So all different kinds of people over the last 100 years have used this tactic. And it is a well-established, nonviolent tactic to create political change. Well, one of the things people often ask is, why BDS now and why Israel? And I think, as uh, Omar will argue much more eloquently than I will, um, that everything else has really been tried. That before 48, Palestinians and Jews lived together in historic Palestine, mostly fairly peaceably, until the Jews with British colonial support started claiming the land as their own. And that was the beginning of the trouble. There have been a whole variety of pan-Arab strategies, and from 47 on, multiple UN resolutions, international laws, Geneva conventions, international court rulings. In the 60s, we had the PLO, mostly in exile and then in Ramallah. There have been multiple wars, two intifadas, suicide attacks, you know, Palestinian rocket fire from Gaza, and years of sophisticated and devastating Israeli incursions and targeted assassinations in the occupied Palestinian territories. There have been more peace proposals than we can count in frameworks and processes, and the situation has only been getting worse and worse. And if we look at today in the United States, Obama's initiative floundered on Netanyahu's refusal to stop settlement growth. But if you think about it more seriously, Obama also refused to exert real political pressure. And what did he have available? He could have threatened to cut off military aid and end political cover. He could have demanded the end to occupation. He could have made it clear that the end of the conflict needs to be based on international law, human rights for all, and UN resolutions. These are the keys to a permanent solution. So I think we can ask, how can the United States credibly broker Israeli-Palestinian negotiations while bankrolling Israel's military machine 
and ignoring continued human rights violations. So I think people of good conscience who are concerned with the fate of Jewish Israelis and Palestinians have real concerns here. Is any solution, including the two-state solution, possible anymore? And politically, what a number of Israeli activists that I work with are now saying, is there a rise of fascism in Israel? What is this right-wing swing that we're seeing? So this brings us to the question of why Israel? There are a lot of worse offenders, and there certainly are a lot of worse offenders in this world. But I think no other injustice is so critically supported by our tax dollars. 20% of all US foreign aid goes to Israel, plus we provide tremendous political support, special status. The international community treats Israel as if it were a normal progressive Western democracy. Not that that doesn't have a lot of warts in itself, but that's what we treat Israel as. But this makes the operations of the Israeli state far more accountable to the international community that supports it. But I think when all is said and done, the main reason to support BDS is that is what Palestinian civil society is asking us internationals to do. Starting in 2002 with the call for BDS, in 2004 with the academic and cultural boycott, and then in 2009, Palestinian Christian leadership in a document called the Kairos Palestine document affirmed BDS as a courageous form of peaceful resistance. And you know, lots of stuff is happening in Boston in this regard. On campuses all over the city and surroundings, there are various Students for Justice in Palestine type groups that are researching university investments. Jewish Voice for Peace launched a national TIA craft campaign that we're working on in Boston to end TIA craft's investment in companies that profit from the occupation. An important aid organization, Grassroots International, has joined Jewish Voice for Peace's call supporting divestment from one of the companies that contributes to land and water confiscation. There's also now a BDS coalition that includes over 20 groups in the Boston area that are working on a boycott of Sabra dipping hummus and tribe hummus. Both companies are partly owned by Israeli companies. Sabra supports the IDF's, the Israeli Defense Forces Golani Brigade, which is known for its aggressive and egregious human rights violations. And I should mention that this Sabra should be not confused with Sabra hummus of Norwood, which has a green pine tree on it, so you can always figure out which is the good hummus and which is the bad hummus. <laughs> uh, Tribe supports the Jewish National Fund, which has contributed to the ethnic cleansing of Palestine, uh, often by planting trees over destroyed Palestinian villages. So there's lots happening in the city, lots for you to learn and much to do. I'm just going to end with a bit of housekeeping. Omar's going to speak for about 30 to 40 minutes. He and I are then going to have 20 minutes of conversation together, which I'm very much looking forward to. And then there's 20 minutes of Q&A. And I will be calling on individuals, so you'll raise your hand, you ask your question. I request that questions only last a minute. No speeches, please. We have a speaker here who's giving the speeches. I will repeat the question so that everybody can hear it, and then Omar will be answering it. And I hope we can all engage in respectful listening, and I will vigorously enforce these rules of engagement. Um, after the question and answer period, we'll have book signing, and I hope there are enough books for everyone to get one for them and their best friends. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. Can you hear me well in the back? I have some problems with my throat today, so... I'll try to speak a bit louder. It's the, sm it's the thinner one that you need to Oh, the thinner one. Yeah. OK, exactly. good. Um, I'm very proud to speak at Harvard on BDS. I know it took a lot of work to get this happening, so I applaud the student groups and PSC and everyone who helped put this together. Thank you very much. One of Africa's uh, most important contemporary writers, Ngugi Wa Thiong'o, wrote in his book, Decolonizing the Mind, about the ultimatum imperialism gives to the oppressed, accept theft or death. He says, the oppressed and the exploited of the earth maintain their defiance, liberty from theft. But the biggest weapon wielded and actually daily unleashed by imperialism against that collective defiance is the cultural bomb. The effect of a cultural bomb is to annihilate a people's belief in their names, 
in their languages, in their environment, in their heritage of struggle, in their unity, in their capacities, and ultimately in themselves. It makes them see their past as one wasteland of non-achievement, and it makes them want to distance themselves from that wasteland. It even plants serious doubts about the moral rightness of struggle. Possibilities of victory are seen as remote, ridiculous dreams. The intended results are despair, despondency, and a collective death wish." End of quote. Rather than falling into despondency, despair, and this collective death wish, Palestinians have crossed the threshold of fear, as recently seen also Arabs have in many Arab countries, especially in Tunisia, Egypt, and elsewhere. Uh, so we're living in a moment that's extremely critical, extremely important, and for once, not that gloomy. We often start our speeches, we're living at a critical juncture where everything is so bleak and hopeless and, and therefore we have to struggle. No, now we're living in a moment of real hope and irreversible transformations to the right side, finally. We're seeing real transformations in the Arab world. Israel is losing a lot of its past um, famed strategic service to Western imperialism. Uh, its main, one of its main objectives was to suppress any possibility of Arab revolt so that the West can continue exploiting our resources. Well, it failed to do that. So what good is it? So that's an important question that will come up and is already coming up and it's, it's feeding the discourse and the debates in the US establishment even about Israel's role in serving Western imperialism and especially serving US um, establishment's interest. This uh, background, Israel's loss of the umbrella of Arab complicity and the, the, the prospects of Palestinian, of, sorry, Arab governments becoming democratic, reflecting their people's opinions, which includes opposition to Israel's occupation and apartheid, will certainly feed the Palestinian struggle for self-determination and freedom. So the BDS movement is very inspired and emboldened by the Arab revolutions in the region. If we go back to the discussion about the cultural bomb that Ngugi so well talked about, uh, Israel has focused on denying Palestinian existence in many, many ways, including by targeting our culture as such. An Israeli researcher, uh, a PhD student at Ben Gurion University, and he's a Jewish Israeli student, uh, for your information, uh, revealed that tens of thousands of Palestinian books that were stolen from Palestinian homes during the Nakba were destroyed, systematically destroyed by Israel. Others were pillaged and kept till now in Israeli universities. And this researcher said that Israel systematically destroyed those books to, quote, Judaize the country, end of quote. The point was to cut off Palestinians from their heritage and culture. So this researcher goes on to say that this was a cultural massacre undertaken in a manner that was worse than European colonialism, which safeguarded the items it stole in libraries and museums, ironically. Uh, Israel's suppression of Palestinian education and culture did not stop at the Nakba, it continued. Even in the first Intifada, which started in 1987, which was predominantly a nonviolent, peaceful protest, popular protest against Israel's occupation, uh, Israel criminalized Palestinian education. Soon after <coughs> the Intifada broke out, a few months after, Israel shut down all six Palestinian universities, all 13 colleges, and a few days after that, the Israeli radio announced that the army had ordered all 1,194 schools in the West Bank closed as well until further notice. Some universities like Birzeit were shut for four consecutive years. Students denied education completely. So Palestinian education went underground at that stage. Palestinian professors had to teach and teachers had to teach in mosques, churches, community centers, homes, basements, away from the eyes of soldiers. If a child was caught carrying a textbook, he would be imprisoned. It was seriously criminalized. The entire education system was criminalized. In fact, on 19 April 1989, at the height of the Intifada, the Jerusalem Post reported that the Israeli police had, quote, and listen well, quote, 
uncovered a network of illegal classes held by West Bank universities at private high schools in East Jerusalem. So that was big news in the Jerusalem Post at the time. So when people discuss Israel's democracy, when they say, why boycott Israel when it's a democratic state? Um, I know many in this room already know the answer, but for those who still need further convincing, and, and a state that occupies, a state that ethnically cleanses, a state that burns books or destroys them, and a state that continues its apartheid regime can never be a democracy. <laughs> but Palestinians in Israel have the right to vote. Despite all the oppression and racial discrimination and so on, Palestinian citizens of Israel can vote. So here's was what Ilan Pape, the famous Israeli historian, had to say about that aspect. He says, Israel is what we in political science called, uh, call a heron folk democracy, democracy only for the masters. The fact that you allow people to participate in the formal side of democracy, namely to vote or to be elected, is meaningless if you don't give them any share in the common good or in the common resources of the state or if you discriminate against them, despite the fact that you allow them to participate in the elections. Pape goes on to say, on almost every level, from official legislation, through governmental practices, to social and cultural attitudes, Israel is only a democracy for one ethnic group." End of quote. In this context, the BDS movement becomes a natural reaction to Israel's occupation colonization and apartheid. And I'll explain the apartheid term because it's not very well understood. <clears throat> the BDS call came out in 2005. Uh, uh, a great majority of Palestinian civil society supported that call. And by Palestinian civil society, we don't just mean in the occupied West Bank, Gaza, including East Jerusalem, but also Palestinians in 48, inside Israel, citizens of the State of Israel, and most importantly, Palestinian refugees, the exilic community, who happen to be the majority of the Palestinian people. Since the Oslo Accords signed between the PLO and the government of Israel, the definition of the Palestinian people was reduced by the hegemonic powers into just those in the occupied territories. So when you hear about polls saying 60% of Palestinians support this or are against that, they're talking about the West Bank and Gaza. They're ignoring that two-thirds of the Palestinians are not under occupation. The majority are refugees, and there's a small minority, about 1.3 million, who are citizens of the State of Israel. And even among the Palestinian citizens of Israel, you have about 300,000 uh, internally displaced persons. Those who carry Israeli citizenship and were ethnically cleansed from their villages and cannot reclaim their property despite being citizens of the state, simply because they're not Jewish. So you have a case like Ayn Hod, a village near Haifa, where many of the people who were ethnically cleansed did not leave to Lebanon. They stayed and they created a kind of a refugee camp very close to their village, almost overlooking their village. And every day they wake up and see their beautiful houses. That was one of the few villages that was not destroyed. It was a beautiful buildings. So they kept them and they turned it into an artist colony, a Jewish artist colony. So every day they see their houses occupied by those wonderful liberal Jewish Israeli artists who are otherwise, you know, support the environment and the right of ants and dolphins and all kinds of causes. Not that I have anything against dolphins, but you would expect humans to deserve equal treatment to dolphins. Um, <clears throat> so the BDS call uh, addresses the three basic rights of the three main segments of the Palestinian people. Ending the occupation of 1967, ending the system of racial discrimination inside Israel against its own Palestinian citizens, the indigenous Palestinians, and most importantly, the right of return of refugees in accordance with UN Resolution 194. 